Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. My name is Chiara Ricciardone. I finished my PhD in rhetoric at UC Berkeley, and I am the co-founder of... Ah. Shall start again. Thank you. Good afternoon. Better? OK. My name is Chiara Ricciardone. I have my PhD in rhetoric from UC Berkeley. And I had the, the pleasure and the privilege this term of teaching a mini course of these amazing students of how to change the world, theories and practice at Bard College. I'm also the provost of Activist Graduate School, and this is my co-founder, Michael White. Hi, my name is Michael White. I am the co-creator of Occupy Wall Street. I um, did my PhD at an experimental school in Switzerland, and we, we co-taught how to change the world with these um, Bard students, and I'm the program director of Actors Graduate School, which we will tell you more about in a second. So this class that we taught at Bard was really an experiment. It was an experiment really in the question of, can you actually teach activism? Um, and in, the, in our first class, one of our students really challenged that assumption, which I thought was amazing. Is activism something like engineering or physics um, that is a set of discrete skills that can be taught, or is it instead something that involves some sort of intuition that, like art, painting, that might be something that you're born with, or is it kind of in between those two areas? Is it something that you could teach general principles of, but you can't teach something very specific around? And I think one of the conclusions that we came to is that if you're going to have, if you're going to teach an effective theory of change, the theory itself must be one that changes. With activism, you can't just say, um, you know, let me tell you how Martin Luther King organized the March on Washington, and these are the 10 steps, and go ahead and do that again, because you will achieve the same results. I think we all kind of know this is a discipline that is um, different in that way. So over the course of the course, we realize that if our experiments are successful, then what we will be creating is something called critical activism. And it's something that I think combines the, the best of the activist world and the best of the academic world. Often in the activist world, there's such urgency, such pressure to act that there's not enough time for reflection. There's such hot disagreement over tactics and violence and nonviolence. Um, on the contrary, in academic spaces, there can be too much critique. There can be the kind of critique that kills the desire to act, and there can be a comfortableness that also can kill the desire to act. So we're hoping both in this class and in the, the project of Activist Graduate School to create a hybrid space for critical activism to emerge that produces new innovative activist practice. Practices that challenge our assumptions about what activism is instead of operating in a nostalgic or honorific or traditional mode of activism. Bruno Latour has written about critique. What would critique do if it could be associated with more, not less, with multiplication, not subtraction? Through our teaching, we're hoping that we can multiply ways of thinking about and doing activism. The aim is not so much to just destroy old scripts, but rather to create new ones, new ways of playing the game. So as we kind of mentioned, part of the experiment was an in-person class. Um, and part of the experiment is this, is this online school that we're starting. So um, Bard was gracious enough to, uh, for us to use this as an experiment. So we actually taught this class with Bard students. But we had two camera uh, people in the class filming the entire thing. And then that will be edited and then made available to online students. We're doing the same thing at UCLA in January. That class is gonna be about housing justice, where we're gonna, again, teach a class about housing justice, but film it and edit it and make it online. So this is, a, this is an experiment not only in, um, I think, activist pedagogy in face-to-face, -face, but also, can this then go to the next level? And I think, hopefully, we're about to move right into hearing from our students. I think, hopefully, the in-person um, class was a success, and we'll have to wait and see if the online portion, can, if it can also translate. Um, so, The title of our panel today is, Where Do We Go From Here? And over the, we asked each of our students to come up with a campaign that they thought would change the world. And our main criterion was that it's something that would be they were passionate enough about that it would sustain their interest over the, um, over the period of the course. And their topics were really varied, their approaches are really varied. We wanna, we wanna have them share those campaigns with you today in part as a barometer, so we can see where the young activists think 
that we're going, where the uh, key leverage points of change are. So please allow me to introduce Ella McGrail, Eli Bickford, Maya Aga, Aslan Makbul, Yuval Elbaz, Danielle Degutz, Yona M. Benstein, Austin Dilly, and Emily Gilbert. So we're gonna ask each of them to come up and present their campaign briefly to you and please hold back your enthusiastic applause until the end and then we'll give them all one big round of applause at the end. Thank you. Ella. Hi, my name is Ella McGrail. I'm a sophomore and I'm a written arts major. And the change I would most like to see in the world is an end to the corrupting influence of money and politics basically putting an end to the system that allows the rich and powerful to rig our government for their own purposes. <laughs> Thanks. So to bring about this change, I plan to pass a 28th Amendment to the Constitution that would state once and for all that corporations do not count as people and money does not count as freedom of speech. The, this goal would be achieved in three main ways. The first would be to use our, we'll have our group meet with activism groups across the country that represent all different types of issues from racial injustice to climate change and discuss how money and politics impedes all those issues from actually getting solved and discuss how a 20th Amendment could help us all advance our movements. Um, step two would be using this and our own network to get as many candidates as possible during the 2020 elections to go on record saying that they support the amendment and would fight for it. Um, this pressure would be at the state as well as the federal level because while we're pushing for the amendment in Congress, we also should be pushing the state legislatures to pass resolutions to call, formally call for the 28th Amendment. In fact, 19 states have already done this, and if we achieve 34 states, then that would mean a constitutional convention could be called at which we could push for the amendment. I expect that even most of the politicians that take the pledge to support the amendment will probably still be taking a lot of donations from corporations and from p political action committees and that basically their idea will be to say they'll do it, get elected, and then bury it or water it down. So to try and prevent that from happening, we're going to have our supporters barrage their elected officials with visits, letters, phone calls throughout their term of office reminding them that they're um, constituents are paying attention that their constituents demand a strong amendment. Additionally, the, um, the threat of a constitutional convention will likely prompt the, will likely prompt Congress to act in some way in regards to the amendment because it's probably within their interest to prevent a convention from taking place at which the entire constitution could be rewritten. So my approach will bring positive change because while our politicians are so susceptible to bribery, our government will be used to advance their interests at the, 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 the interests of the wealthy and the interests of wealthy institutions rather than general welfare. Our slogan for this movement will be people before profit. Thank you. My name is Eli Bickford. Um, I'm a uh, Middle Eastern and I'm a joint major Middle Eastern studies and human rights. Um, and I want to change the way in which we perceive otherness. Um, in a moment where we're watching the rise of fascism and um, uh, populism that continues to divide us, I think that we need to be asking not only the question, how do we how do we um, kind of heal this divide, but also what is it about us um, and our relationships that allow us to be divided? Um, and I feel like, I feel like, uh, for me the answer to this question lies in the fact that we don't know each other across lines of, uh, of, lines of difference. And moreover, every aspect of our system isolates us from the essential humanity of the other, whatever it may be. 
For example, I definitely know all of the points that are famously conservative right now, and I hate all of them. But I definitely can't remember the last time I sat down with a conservative and talked about love, and talked about pain, and talked about the essential emotions that connect us. So to bridge this gap, I want to put two people in a room together from completely different backgrounds, and I want them to talk about life. And I want to take this personal connection, which is so crucial and important, and I want to amplify it. And I want to insta kind of, I want to put, create programs that harness that personal connection in s connecting young people from diff different backgrounds in schools, connecting people in churches and people in mosques, connecting law enforcement officials with the communities that they um, police, really in every area of society where we can identify difference. And the kind of guiding ideology behind this is the thought that if we can connect other more and more to real people and real emotions, it becomes much harder for us to be pitted against other people. So, of course, I anticipate, um, I anticipate some sort of resistance in some way to this in the form of, for example, I think corporate lobbies um, would, would very much criticize any, any programs that kind of pushed against their bottom line. But at the end of the day, socially speaking, we don't conceive of non-political conversation as activism. And therefore, by changing the definition of activism in that way, to, to center it around just talking through difference, I think we can initiate a global movement that is, a, is grassroots in the sense that it's happening in all different communities with the essential and just very specific goal of creating a dialogue where there isn't one happening. And I think that that, on, on the scale that I want to implement it, that has the power um, to lay the groundwork and foundation for a unity that, that will bring us together when the revolution comes. Thanks. Hello, my name is Maya Aga and I'm a freshman. During the v Vietnam War, the slogan, old enough to vote, old enough to fight, was used by student activists to increase pressure on Congress to create the 26th Amendment. I want to change the world by giving 16-year-olds the ability to vote through automatic voter registration when they sign up for high school. I will do this by creating a national social media campaign, collecting signatures categorized by state, by each state. And then I will go and speak to our elected officials. They would be forced to listen to, to us out of the fear of retaliation or the promise of votes. It is simple. We will say we have X amount of votes for, for you if you vote on amending the 26th um, Amendment. Teenagers pay taxes, they work, they drive, they marry, therefore they should be able to vote. My opponents would say that teenagers are too ignorant or stupid, but the fact of the ma ma matter is most Americans are anyways. <laughs> Thirty-seven percent of Americans don't even know their their elected officials. Our youth right now is learning about our system. They are taking government. They are learning how our systems work. They are our future, and we should give them a voice. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Aslan McBull, and I'm a senior majoring in environmental science. Um, my campaign is focused on tap water. 783 million people in the world do not have access to clean water. Mexico, South Africa, Peru, and China are all a few places 
in the world that have dire drinking water problems. What's even more shocking is that in, even here in the United States, many places deal with the same issue. Earlier this year in Brady, Texas, a community of about 6,000 people, radium, radium levels in the drinking water were found to be nine times higher than the federal limit. One of the underlying themes in all of these issues is that many people are overwhelming, overwhelmingly in the unknown about their water quality. Many people lack access to basic, basic information on their water quality. This is why my campaign will fight to spread clear, universally understandable information on water quality in order to promote better access to clean and equitable water. This will be achieved by one, creating more easily accessible and up-to-date information on water quality. Uh, two, informing entire communities on, on their local water quality issues. Three, strengthening individual knowledge about, about the science behind water quality. This campaign will start in the local community here on the Bard Cam College campus, where there's a lot of mi misinformation on uh, water quality. I believe utilizing scientific spaces as hubs for citizen science and inf information centers is an idea worth exploring. The more access individuals have to testing and gathering information on their water, water quality, the more likelihood there is that clear and factual information is spread. Working examples of online information hubs include environmentalworkinggroup.org, which offers uh, information on water contamination based on a person's zip code. Um, but of course, I believe there will be counter tactics to my campaign, which will be mainly led by individuals who insist on spreading misinformation. I'll respond to this by inviting those who decide to spread misinformation to citizen science labs and perform simple assays to either confirm or challenge their beliefs. In conclusion, this campaign will bring about positive change by creating an atmosphere of scientific knowledge-based information within communities and putting the power in the hands of citizens themselves. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Yuval Elbaz and I'm a freshman here at BART. Um, and the change I wanna see most in the world is a change in systematic inequalities, especially relating to power and money dynamics. Today in our world, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and I wanna work on this statement. I think the best or one of the best ways to do this is through education. Education is an equalizer and a balancer. If everyone has the opportunity to get it, there are more op opportunities overall. Um, and it is known that students from higher class um, families are six times more likely to get a bachelor's degree than students from low income uh, families. I think this statistic is very shocking and I, I wanna be working on the minimizing of this gap. I will be doing this through creating a program, an integration program. This program will connect college students with high school students, um, and these college students will be federally funded to guide and help that, the high school students with the college acceptance pro, uh, pro process. Um, they, they will be, there will be a matching system, so every college student will be matched with a high school student who they have similar interests and backgrounds with. And through this, there will be more and more college, um, sorry, um, high school students who will be um, Larry class and integrated into these colleges. There will be more knowledge, knowledge distributed and more of a diverse workplace. And eventually through this, there will be um, a certain balance in the power structures that we have. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle. I'm a senior at Bard, and I study math. Um, the change I most want to see 
in the world is a reduction in the amount of landfill-bound waste produced by households. To bring about this change, I propose a campaign to make it easier to compost at home by enacting a curbside compost collection program, similar to today's recycling programs, and to de-incentivize wasteful habits by charging a trash collection fee by weight per household. Um, this goal will be achieved in two ways. First, by putting pressure on local government to create the collection program by forming a committee, holding and attending local government meetings, tabling in public places to spread our message, and also by putting up an art installation made using our town's trash as materials. Opponents will certainly be against this idea of a trash removal fee and will counter the campaign by spreading the message that trash is not our job to worry about or that we should instead focus on our day-to-day -day personal problems. Um, we'll use a counter tactic, changing this campaign to be educational, teaching people why food waste is indeed everybody's problem. We can do this by going door to door, giving out food scrap collection bins and instructions explaining how they work and why it is important. Also, we can provide free educational sessions in accessible spaces in town where we show documentaries and teach about how food waste contributes to climate change. Methane, the gas produced when food is sent to landfills, is responsible for 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. The UN released a report this past Monday that we have 12 years left to change our habits to keep global temperature rise under 1.5 degrees Celsius to prevent devastating heat, drought, and floods. This campaign will bring about positive change because many people today do not know that it is easy and essential for them to compost and be a part of this effort. Also, come to Preston Theater Friday, October 19th from 7.15 to 9.15 to learn about 100 solutions to reverse climate change. I just hitched solution number 60 and there are 99 more. Good evening. Um, my name is Yona Benstein, and I'm a freshman here at Bard. I'm hoping to uh, study political science and economics. Um, after taking this course, the change that I most want to see in the world is a stop to the harmful effects of factory farming and the consumption of red meat on our environment. Um, globally, a third of our planet's arable land is occupied by livestock feed cultivation and it was the main causes for biodiversity loss and responsible for more greenhouse gases than all of the world transportation systems combined. So it's a really issue and we need to address uh, for the survival of our planet. Um, so working within a market-based economy, I want to create an educational campaign that will change consumer behavior um, to reduce the demand for these products and thus also reducing the supply by putting economic pressure on corporations and food companies. In order to make this the top news story, I want to create a campaign um, organizing a group of people to create marches and protests across this country and an awareness campaign that will work on various platforms, advertising our messages on um, newspapers, billboards, buses, or information stands in the streets. Once we change the national conversation in these topics and raise awareness, we can put pressure on corporations that will be afraid of a loss of profit. Um, and thus um, creating a dialogue with these corporations to create a new market for plant-based products and advocating for a more ethical and sustainable practices within this industry. I think this campaign could be effect uh, effective um, in making corporations really take responsibility and take into account uh, social and environmental concerns while working for the benefit of the greater good and not only for profit. This will also make individuals across this country from all ages think more critically about what they're eating and what they choose to put in their body um, and where their food comes from before it gets to their shelf. This will also make people realize their great power as consumers to create environmental and social change through everyday life decisions. And I believe that together through education, and changing our everyday behavior, we can sustain the planet and create a meaningful change in the future. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, um, my name is Austin Dilley. I'm a sophomore student at Bard, hopefully joint moderating in human rights and photography. My campaign is to el effectively eliminate ICE, or Immigration Control Enforcement, and the Border Patrol Agency. Um, the medium by which we will do this is through adapting already existing reactionary um, community-based organizing around ICE detection. So if you've been paying attention the past two years and prior to that, as you should have, especially on social media, you may have noticed stories that people will post of locations of ICE officers. Along with that, they'll post a location, a date, and a time with a photo and share that in, on a story. So a 24-hour time-stamped uh, image sharing source. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter all has these outlets. And so what this has effectively been able to do is allow people in pre predominantly community um, of immigrants who are at risk of deportation and warranted search and seizure to understand where ICE is operating. So through these images, they've been shared around communities and you can see where ICE is operating. Um, this is nothing new. ICE is able to operate within a 100-mile border zone of any port of entry, regardless of land or sea, so that it, it takes about nine-tenths, or sorry, nine out of ten of the most populous metropolitan areas in the United States, and two-thirds of the American population is under the direct jurisdiction of the uh, Border Patrol agencies. Um, however, since the election of Donald Trump, we have seen a intense militarization of these forces as well as intense interactions within that 100 mile zone that is unprecedented prior to this point. It is also a direct infringement of the Fourth Amendment which protects us from unwarranted right and uh, search and seizure. So what we're seeing is these agents going within 100 miles of borders, stopping and frisking people that they shouldn't be, that they are not allowed to, and demanding papers, demanding citizenship. And I don't know about you, but I don't carry around proof of citizenship. Most people do not carry around a passport. Most people don't even have a passport regardless of their citizenship. And so this is creating huge issues for communities that are predominantly immigrants. And so what my, my plan is to create an open source decentralized web app. This will allow for people in these communities to target and centralize where ICE is operating. They can submit an image with a timestamp, a date, and a location, which will then be checked on site by a local activist, which will then be uploaded through this, um, uh, this web app into a heat map, so allowing people to look, open up on the day of, discover where ICE is operating, where are their hotspots, where is the locations they consistently go and avoid these areas. Third, there will then be a text blast sent out with immediate locations of ICE officers, allowing people who do not have access to the app but still want to be aware to know where to avoid. Finally, the data will be eliminated off um, cloud-based servers and stored locally, so there's no way to trace this. It becomes decentralized and harder to break down. And finally, the heat map stays. It allows us to track their locations but not have specific data information, so there's nothing to be targeted by uh, anti-opponents of this application. And effectively will neutralize ICE. And from neutralizing them, making them impossible to function, making them extremely transparent, extremely visual, visual, we can then move forward in a campaign to completely eliminate border patrol, to completely eliminate American borders and open a free mode of transportation. The world is heating up and ice will melt. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Emily Gilbert. I am a senior studying sociology here at Bard. Um, and one change I really wanna see in the world is an end to gender inequality. Um, as a first crucial step towards this goal, I envision a political campaign which would work to close the gender wage gap. Um, not only to end gender-based uh, wage discrimination through equal pay for equal work, but also to ensure that fields dominated by women, often those involving emotional labor, are valued, um, and to guarantee that women don't have to sacrifice their career in order to have children. Um, this campaign will be achieved through a three-pronged plan. Um, the first, large-scale strikes and walkouts. Um, and this would include women from all levels of the income bracket. Um, second, a movement to institutionalize pay scales. Um, and paid gender neutral parental leave. Um, and then lastly, a consciousness raising campaign to correct some of the misconceptions surrounding the gender pay gap. 
Um, I believe that the time is ripe in this country for a labor movement. Unemployment is low, making it more difficult to replace workers, while rising inequality coupled with stagnant wages have led to righteous anger. If, as I expect, companies react by attempting closed door meetings with a select few uh, worker representatives, we will demand democratic open forum style uh, discussions to ensure that any agreements will be completely transparent. It's time for women and workers to take power. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let's just give everyone a round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing. So um, it was a real honor to uh, work with these students. We didn't, um, we didn't focus the class around telling them what they should campaign on. They were free to pick whatever they wanted to campaign on. Instead, we, we looked at the theories of change of activism. Um, so it's refreshing, I think, to listen to the young people, not only because of the specific campaigns that they picked, so I noticed that certain people in the audience perked up when they heard something that they really resonated with them, all of a sudden, like, yeah, that's what I want to be into, but also to give you a sense, I think it's very interesting, just to give you a sense of where young people are thinking about where, so, where they think social change can happen. So I, I draw my own conclusions about general uh, characteristics of... Um, where people are pushing, but I think we saw a lot of um, cultural initiatives, we saw a lot of environmental concerns, we saw some, you know, Austin's campaign to abolish ICE, these things that really challenge kind of governmental structures. Um, but I think it was, it's very interesting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask a few questions of, the, of, the, of our distinguished panelists, and then there's gonna be a chance for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, um, start formulating it. We don't have very, very much time for the moderated part, but the first question that I want to ask basically is, so in the course, we each week was on a different theory of change. So we ran through basically theories of change that say that we can use direct action, theories of change that are more structuralist that say that no, it's economic factors that cause revolutions. Um, other theories say that it's subjectivism, that in fact uh, you have to change your mind in order to change the world. And then there's of course theories that are more about uh, divine intervention in our world. So the first question that I kind of want to throw to Eli, Ella, and Austin is, um, how has your thinking about activism changed from taking the course? How did you think about activism coming into the class, and how did it? How do you now think about it? How is it, how's it differed? And there's a couple microphones. Just pass it if you... You don't have to turn it on. They'll turn it on for you. There's one over there, too. Um, so I think that... Um, I'll, just, I'll just start by saying that a number of us were in D.C. Uh, protesting Kavanaugh the other day, and um, I can't speak for all of us, uh, and it, we had a very, we, I mean, I'm sure we all had a different experience, but I think one thing was the weight of the failure, not of Kavanaugh being confirmed, although, of course, that's the biggest, the worst thing, but just for me, I was very struck by the failure and kind of unconvinced by the tactic that we were using by demanding justice in this particular way, going onto the streets and yelling about it. Um, and I think that there's a place for that, but this course has really given me a framework uh, to think about activism as something that's really calculated um, and not, not a reaction in that way. A lot of the people I talked to at the, at, the, at the protest were there kind of like me, who were just like, couldn't deal with it anymore, and their reaction was just, I have to channel this energy somewhere, and those are valid feelings, but I think that this course has really opened my eyes to like, if I have a theory of activism, it's gonna generate better action. Um, I was also in DC on Thursday, and we both got arrested, and a couple other Bard students, Danielle as well, in the Senate Heart Building. Um, but for me, this class has really shown me the necessity to be critical of activism and why do our protests keep failing? And that's kind of the big question we've been asking is why did Occupy fail? Why has Black Lives Matter not been as effective as it needs to be? Why did the Women's March get 1% of the population out yet Trump hasn't been impeached? Why is our protest failing? And for me, this is a really big question for the future of our world and our country right now because we are looking at a rise of the global far right, Brazil, Philippines, most of Europe and America. And I don't think our protest works anymore, and I think this class has taught me how to be critical of protests and why that's so important. Yeah, I would definitely agree with what the guys said and also add that 
I definitely didn't think so much about the non-human ways that, that protests become successful. It's not just someone has a really good idea or gives a really good speech and then things change. It's more like you have to think about also, okay, food prices, economics, even what the, the sun activity by some theories. Um, there's like a lot of structural and social, even people's perspectives, all kinds of things impact whether or not a protest is gonna be effective. And you have to take all of those into consideration whenever you're planning any specific kind of action. But also it was interesting to think about how even if going out and yelling in the streets isn't a particularly effective way we're finding to get policy changed, um, protest can also, the point of protest can also be to um, create solidarity, foster creativity, foster networking. So there's all kinds of goals and all kinds of methods. Thank you guys. So yesterday was our last class and it was on activist futurism. And we asked the students to read a report from the National Security Council, National Council of Intelligence rather, from the military about global trends that they see emerging over the next 10 or 20 years. So uh, continued economic stagnation, uh, increased low level conflict, um, the, the impact of technology, all kinds of different things. And we, we asked students to do a kind of thinking that I think is more common in government and more common in boardrooms, which is how can we exploit, if these, these predictions may be wrong, they often are, but if this is the way that things are going, how should activism respond or how can activism respond? So I wanna ask some, a few of our students, invite them to share their reflections about uh, what is the future of activism? So Yona, Maya, and Danielle, if you care to share your thoughts about that. Yeah, so it's like a big question to answer, I think, but I think the most meaningful thing we can do is create an, an intentional, meaningful dialogue with people that we don't agree with. Because um, like, as we read this report and we saw like, all these like, big threats on the horizon, um, such as like, the fabrics of democracy falling apart or the rise of populism and authoritarianism, or threats like climate change or artificial intelligence, um, it's important for us to like, as activists, to take like a few steps back and try to get a wider perspective and identify these different trends that are happening instead of kind of falling into debate of like the polarizing media of like chasing every news story. Um, so I think we really need to like get out of our comfort zones and our safe spaces and challenge our opinions and create this like coalition of moderate thinkers who can really solve these big problems that we all face and that affect all of us instead of kind of demonizing anyone who opposes our opinions. Hi, um, I, I would say that we need to erase everything we know about activism right now and start over, stop playing the same script. I mean, I was also in DC and they were teaching uh, us how, were, how to get arrested. This is what you do. This is your bail. This is like you will march on these streets and do this exact thing. And I think that we need to start, stop looking in the past and start looking at the future. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about from the report that we read in our last class was that um, there are like 130 waterways that are still like um, not being controlled by anybody. Is that right? And then um, I guess when I think about the future of activism, I think about um, environmental destruction and how in the future we're not gonna have as much access to clean like air and water. So what, the way that I'm really hoping and thinking that activism will go is like through our actions. Um, I hope that people learn to be more self-sufficient and not, re not as reliant on like government and big corporations and we'll move towards um, homesteading and permaculture and learning how to live off the land. Great. Okay, so the last question I just want to ask, and then I want to have questions from the audience, um, is, so you are um, college activists, or some of you self-identify as activists, um, and you've just gone through this course on activism, so what would be your advice to high school students, now that everyone is an activist, it seems like, and are there, high, there are high school students in the room, right? We have a couple. There were more before, but I think they had to go back. Good, we have them over here. So, we have some high school students, 
you are college students. What would be your advice um, to them? And I want to direct this one. Let's have Emily, Aslan, and Yuval kind of jump in on this one. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think one thing that has changed since I was in high school is that uh, protest has become sort of trendy and like Instagrammable, um, which I think is great on one hand because so many more young people are politically engaged than would otherwise be. But on the other hand, Instagram is owned by Facebook, um, which whole business model is collecting our information so that other businesses can sell stuff more easily. So um, I think just having like the self-awareness when you're posting things on social media of like, am I doing this because I actually want to change the way that power functions in this country, or am I posting this because I want people on the internet to think I'm cool? <laughs> Um, yeah, going off of that, um, I think being aware and critical of your actions and knowing what you are doing and the purpose for it is very important. I know that I would always go to protests and feel as if I did something, but I think it's important to know what I, you are working for and what you're supposed to do. Um, and just having specific goals that you think will, you will be able to solve. Yeah, I definitely agree with, with uh, you, Paul, and Emily said. Um, definitely um, one of the biggest things that I feel like activists, high school activists, young activists do uh, in this country is kind of fo follow the script of what's, what's been uh, done before. Um, I feel uh, like in, in the early 60s uh, when civil rights activism was going on, a lot of students were the forefront of, of the activism and a lot of what the tactics they use uh, were kind of the first time being seen. Um, Sit-ins, occupying spaces, and uh, it got a lot of attention. And uh, I think what this generation is missing is really an intention, as, as Yuval was saying, like, really why, why are they doing this and what do they really want the change because if you really want the change you're going to plan ahead you're going to you're going to plan for uh uh counter tactics as as we all uh mentioned in our um campaign proposals we have to be willing to uh plan uh for the inevitable inevitable pushback that we we're going to get so i just feel like plan plan think is all that we can do thank you all right, great. So we will take a couple of questions from the audience. So there's a question in the back. We have this, uh, oh, oh, that's right, I forgot. We wanna, what we want to do is we want to take three questions in a row and then let the, um, the panelists respond so we can batch them up. So why don't we do, there was one back here. We had our, uh, one of our panelists from earlier this morning has a question. I'm going to send you across the entire conference hall, sorry. And then we're going to go back over to this, this person back here. Uh, first, I just want to thank you all for the wonderful presentation. It's inspiring. Um, my doctorate is in education, and I think about and organize around mobility, migration, and education. Um, so I have a question about the pedagogical structure of the classroom, which I'm hoping the students and the facilitators might be able to talk about. And that's around, um, and a, a couple of students made, made points about being able to uh, incorporate who they are in the process. Um, Something that is really beautiful in the teaching and learning process is when you get to be you in that process. So I'm wondering what it looked like to critically explore your own values, how that was facilitated, and then also in the activity of organizing, you have to make a determination around which values you're going to defend. So how is it that you then concluded what you will defend? Great. Fantastic question. Okay. Next, we have this person with the, the Rise Up shirt on. Hi. Um, thank you all for being so incredible and amazing. Like, it's just so powerful to see young people with a vision. It's just great. Um, 
Dan- Danielle, shout out for never missing a turnout opportunity. Like, that is organizing. <laughs> um, so I guess my question is, and um, it's kind of two-part, you know, what support do you all feel you need to actually move your, you know, visions and proposals forward? And then what support are you all willing and able to give to these young people in order to, to be able to uh, move, move their vision forward and make it a reality, both here and when you do it at UCLA? Fantastic question. Okay, one more question over there. Hi, thank you all again for your presentations. Um, One thing that I was just, I think, repeatedly thinking about as you were all going over how you were hoping to uh, affect essentially, and admittedly, I could, it, it, it ranged from person to person, but Fundamentally, it seemed like the activism that you all were hoping to achieve with your individual campaigns was distinct from politics, but necessarily had to affect politics or interact with politics or engage with politics to achieve its end. And I was wondering about how you all thought about the difference between activism and politics as institutions and how you were accounting for that in, how, in the ways you strategized and devised a plan of action. Wow, another excellent question. That one is, that, these are three difficult questions. So let me just recap. We have a question about the pedagogical method. How did the course function? How are you led through the process of, um, evolving self-development, I guess. Um, the second question had to, and I forget, you had such a good phrase, and I just totally blanked on it, but it was about being, the, you. being you. Yeah, the course being you. The second question had to do with what kind of support do you need to move your campaign forward, and what kind of support are we as teachers, facilitators willing to give? And then the third question was the relationship between activism and politics, and uh, with a subcurrent about um, institutionalization and these kind of things. So those are three big questions. So if anyone has, wants to jump in, go ahead. Don't be shy. Um, Yeah, I want to answer your question about politics and activism, because I I think there's a really necessary difference, and a lot of human rights classes we talk about this, is that politics is about reform. Politics works within the system. Politics, you go to your senator, you you petition them, hopefully the gears get moving. I think the reason protest has been effective and the reason it isn't now, and right now it's not effective because we're trying to work within politics, and protest needs to be separate. Protest needs to be, you're gonna jam the gears of the system, you're gonna get in there, you're gonna throw a wrench from whatever their plan is. And when we went down to DC and get, got arrested, part of the thing that felt so helpless is that when we got arrested, is it was obvious the DCPD was not having any, like this was not out of the ordinary for their day. And even for me, it was like I had to take a day off school, I have to go back to pay my bail, but bail was paid, everything was organized. There was no, like, there was nothing really to lose in the activism. And so I think what we were talking about is when the state gives you two options, when you feel hopeless, that's the time when we need to really think about new activism. And we can't think about new activism as politics. Yeah, go ahead. I want to answer your question. Um, I think think one of of the things that this course did for me um, is that just... I mean, taking the example of Occupy Wall Street, for example, I think that in some ways we can look at that as uh, it failed or whatever. But in in other ways, I think that it provided a a new generation of activists with a framework of a kind of non-leadership, like a a type of activism, a type of movement that isn't surrounded around one person at the forefront of that movement. And I think that learning a theory for activism um, and then kind of having those, those frameworks in the back of our mind to, to build off of is like, it, it's, very, it's very incredible in terms of the way that we can then incorporate our own, our own personalities, our own values into activism because it redefines what activism needs to be. It redefines like whether or not I'm going to go do something that somebody else has planned because that is kind of what's expected of activism. And as... Someone was saying it, I think you were saying about art, I think one of the things that that freedom with a, a, a framework for activism gives you is realizing that activism really doesn't need to be, I am going to do this with the explicit 
um, intention of knocking down something, but I, I can go and do this with the explicit intention of creating something, of, of building uh, something that I want to see in the world rather than taking something down that I don't want to see in the world. I don't know if that answers. So. Hi, I'm going to an answer your question uh, really quick. I think that the biggest thing that you can do to help future act activists is to vote. I think vote for politicians who will support and represent the people. That's a some simple answer, but yeah. I think, th I, th I quite agree with Maya, but I also think that um, we don't lack enthusiasm or rage or time. I think a lot of what we lack is listening to each other. I think what we really need from each other and from ourselves is to be able to self-reflect and challenge even the ideas we really are reticent to challenge and really consider what other people are saying, listen to what other people are saying. And I think once we get to that point, it's going to be a lot easier for us to unite and see who the real enemies are rather than bickering all the time. So we had, I just want to say that we had, um, I think one of the tensions, or one of the things that emerged in the class was this idea that a lot of the students conveyed, which is um, a feeling of like wanting to get past partisanship and wanting to unite and wanting to cut across differences and this kind of stuff. I thought it was a very interesting um, theme that emerged. I don't know if that was so important to me when I was a young activist, um, you know, dropping out of school to block traffic and stuff. So I want to talk about this very quickly, and then I want to ask you about, also about the pedagogical question, because this is something that we do think about a lot. So going to your question in the back, is how the question of how to teach activism is, I think, really um, difficult. So what we did in this class is that each, so they were told to come in with a campaign that they wanted to work on, and then each class focused on a different way of thinking about how change happens, um, based kind of on my book, but also on outside readings. And we didn't, get into, so we didn't critique their campaign proposals, we didn't critique what they wanted to fight for, we didn't tell them this would work, this won't work, because I personally believe that it's very difficult to tell what will and will not work. Um, instead, what we did is try to convince them each week that a different way of achieving change is the most effective. That was the process. And so by the fourth week, we were trying to convince them, by the fifth week, we are trying to convince them that actually it's sunspots and divine intervention, you know, and then we end the course by saying, and this is how the world's gonna be in 20 years. So how does that change how you think about doing your activism? And we didn't get into ideological questions, and, and so everything they picked was just what they wanted to do. I think my response might combine um, a response to your question about pedagogy and a response to your question about how to support students in their projects going forward. Um, and I think the answer involves a kind of contradiction of uh, friendly opposition, in a way. I think that on a personal level, at every step, we're trying to support and encourage and connect and, um, and that kind of thing. But at a strategic level, I think what we're trying to get across is actually the, the best kinds of campaigns are not going to be the ones where people pat you on the back. It's not going to be the ones where people say, what a great idea. Uh, we've all just been waiting for that. It's going to be the one, it might be the one that people dismiss as, that's never going to work. I've never heard of that. Um, and so that, that um, process of trying to remove assumptions about what's working and give them the strength and the courage to stand apart from the crowd and do something different, do something that's not gonna, you know, not just because all your friends are going down to DC and it feels good to hang out with all your friends and do something that feels um, like we all agree on it, but to take the, to actually generate the kind of courage to do a different kind of campaign that looks unfamiliar and then therefore exploits the element of surprise. So I think that's the kind of support that I'm trying to give and it's also um, hopefully giving them more space to access more parts of themselves that they didn't um, know were necessarily there. And that's a, a big goal to achieve in six sessions, but um, that's, that, that would be my aspiration. Yeah, and I'll just want to add one thing to that and then we should take just a couple more questions because we're running out of time. One more question is that it's, I think one of the dangers of trying to do activist education is you don't, there is a danger that you can actually just convince them not to be activists, which is not my goal. I, I've been activist since I was 13 years old. So it is a delicate process of saying, this doesn't work, but at the same time there is something that will work. 
You know, I think, so I think that's really important tension that I want. So I don't think that we convince anyone not to be an activist, I hope. Um, but anyways, we have time for one question. And this person over here really wants to, he has a red shirt on, he really wants to, mainly because I'm sending the microphone back and forth. That's a game I'm playing here. <laughs> Yes. And I also don't understand why people go to Washington um, uh, to protest, get arrested, and then accept bail, and cooperate yeah. with the system, and, and, and become a statistic. Yeah. Um, uh, refuse bail. Spend some nights in jail. Uh, organize around that. Get your family concerned. Get your community concerned. Build a movement around yourself. So, uh, so the structure of your question is, you're wrong about Occupy, let me tell you what you should do. Which is, <laughs> which is good, but, you, but I just want to do flag, I was the co-creator of Occupy Wall Street, so I, I'm giving them permission to say it failed, even though we might disagree. The other question, though, about um, the scripting of the arrest, why not ask them what they think about that? Because I think that perhaps they already agreed before you told them what to do. So what, did, what do you feel about the scripting of the arrest? How was that experience for you? I guess about the arrest, I just want to say that I wish I knew more about how the law works because, I mean, I didn't pay my bail yet. I have to go back in like two weeks to do that. So I guess I don't know what I'm going to do. And um, I feel like we all just kind of pay it like out of fear. But like, I feel like if we were more educated about like what would happen otherwise, then we would be able to like make a stronger statement. I mean, I went to DC because I was pissed as hell. I mean, I went to DC knowing it wouldn't work. I was 100% confirmed Kavanaugh was still gonna get uh, appointed. I was 100% sure my arrest and bail was gonna be a joke. And to your point of why didn't I get arrested? Well, honestly, because I don't have the time. I wish I did. I wish I could, I wish this could be the sword I could 100% fall on, but like, I had to organize this through the school. I had to get a van back at 5.50 in the morning. I had to, I had to, had to, had to. And it sucks. But the thing with activism is we're not to the point where we have nothing left to lose yet, right? We're not there. And I want to be there, but it, it's a bad situation, but it's not the absolute worst, right? And it, what? Straight white cis men. No, and I agree with that. And I'm, what I'm saying is with this Kavanaugh thing and going to D.C. was for us, a response, it was reactive. And getting arrested was, we didn't do more because we didn't know what our rights are. And I would also argue, I went to DC, but I was one of the ones who chose not to get ar arrested. But I mean, I think like the time where they were being booked and pr processed, I was able to, to go and do a things that I find effective. I mean, I was able to chase down Republican senators and urge, and urge them to vote no on Kavanaugh. So I feel like the time that they spent fighting and getting arrested could also be used for things that would enact change too. I think also that you, in the one thing that we talked about in class, and I don't want you to be too modest, is that you're, you're all taking the blame. But also in class we talked about your experience with people, I mean people handed you bail money, they gave you like a, a printout of what the, process, the steps would be in the arrest, they led you through security into a building to the place in which you would be arrested. So the whole thing, you, so from my perspective, it sounded more like the blame should be placed on someone else for, for like putting you through a, a a preordained process is that, and part of the preordained process was that you would not stay in jail, that you would be, pro I don't know. Um, just kind of taking it away from the, 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 the fact of the arrest, the specifics of, of that, I think my sense of, of failure of the moment was much more about, like, there, I had this moment where I was chanting like the common, uh, this is what democracy looks like, and I was just so, like overcome by the fact that that was such a lie. Because I just, you know, like democracy can't look like I'm begging my senators who I know are not gonna vote in the interest of the people to do something that, you know, if they do it then, 
you know, it's, we'll all shout and, and yell that it was a huge victory, but no, no, the power structure didn't change, nothing changed. So I feel like there, there were a lot of people there, despite all of this, uh, you know, it was, it was weird and very staged. But despite that, there were a lot of people there who had been there for months and who had been arrested tons of times and who had, you know, done it in the way that you're saying is better to do it. Nothing changed. So I, I, I think that my, my thing was less about like the failure of the tactic and the way we enacted it. It was more just like it was a very important way to reflect on how activism just takes this very, very particular course. And we all accept the course, of, of, uh, we all accept that framework, and if, and if it fails, we don't blame the framework, but we blame like our inability to do something. But it's the framework, it's, it's the way, I mean, we, we need to address the framework. Wow, thank you. So let's just give them all a round of applause. Thank you so much. And that concludes our wonderful session. Thank you again. Thank you. So we're going to go right into our we're going to go right into our final panel. Uh, so I'm, please welcome uh, uh, David Bromwich, who's going to be replacing Uday Mehta and Allison Stanger. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So this will, be, this will be our final panel of the day, and then um, we will have a reception at 6 o'clock, 6.15, and then uh, we begin tomorrow at 9.30. 8.30 tomorrow with a breakout session. That's exactly right. Is I uh, there he is. What? So we want to just close. It's a little weird up there. Yeah, that's all. That's fine. Just up and occupy this. <laughs> Of 
Okay, I think we'll start so people uh, can take their seats. Uh, my name is David Bromwich. I am not on the program uh, that is on the printed program. I, I'm a late substitute for uh, my close friend and Roger Berkowitz's friend, Uday Mehta, uh, who could not make it. Um, I'm introducing uh, for uh, a sort of conversation which means to include the audience in the second half of it, uh, Professor Allison Stanger, uh, who is uh, Russell Lang, class of 1960, professor of international politics and economics uh, at Middlebury College. Uh, Allison Stanger is the author of uh, One Nation Under Contract, The Outsourcing of American Power and Foreign Policy. Uh, and she is completing a new book uh, called tentatively The Pursuit uh, of Leaks. Is that right? Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Leaks. Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Leaks. And is that Yale University Press? Yes. Um, so look out for that book, which will be available probably in a few months. Um, she has been working, as that last title implies, on issues around the dissemination of information, uh, the exporting of information, as well as the, uh, subcontracting outside government, issues about internet and democracy. And she has an article coming out of the next issue of Foreign Affairs about uh, the morality of whistleblow uh, whistleblowing under conditions of normal and abnormal government. She'll be talking about that today uh, for about 20 minutes. I'll then ask her a couple of questions meant to coax out further distinctions, perhaps, or ask her to go a little more deeply into one or another detail of her talk, and then we'll throw it open to discussion for the audience. Well, thanks for sticking it out for this long but uh, very productive day, and thanks for that kind introduction. I feel like I should say a word about Professor Bromwich because He's a huge big deal. He's not in your, your program, but he is the Sterling Professor at Yale University, a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books, enormously intelligent uh, and erudite, and I'm, I'm really feeling very fortunate to be sharing, sharing a stage with him. So I know that I stand, can you hear me okay? Okay. I know that I'm standing between you and wine and cheese. And I'm following a fantastic act of, of students. So my intention is just to kind of very quickly sketch an argument for 20 minutes, maybe less, that will give you a sense of a flavor of my forthcoming book. And the aim is to generate a good discussion, both with David and then with you. We want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm writing this book that's forthcoming with Yale University Press. I'm pleased to say. I finished the very final edits and sent it into production last night from the Bard Library. So, 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 feeling very good about the karma at Bard right now. So, my talk today is based on an exchange, as David mentioned, with Michael Walls that will appear in the next issue of Foreign Affairs. To start off, I wanted to just tell you I'm going to be talking about the IC or the intelligence community, and when I say I see I'm talking about the part of the deep state that's featured in the title of my talk that serves the government regardless of its partisan orientation. So this is really a response to Michael Walzer, who some of you may know as the uh, uh, moral philosopher, the author of Just and Unjust Wars. He wrote a piece in the March-April issue of Foreign Affairs where he identified several types of leaks and whistleblowing and explored their ethical implications. He defined whistleblowing as conveying what a person, quote, believes to be immoral or illegal conduct to her bureaucratic superiors or to the public. And he implies that there's no way to make an objective judgment about intelligence community leaks in the Trump era. All governments, all political parties, and all politicians keep secrets and tell lies, he writes. Some lie more than others, and those differences are important. So he winds up concluding in this article that mentions Donald Trump only twice, that whistleblowing has only an, quote, unofficial role to play in the democratic political universe, and, quote, 
one must recognize both its possible value and its possible dangers. As I mentioned, he only mentioned Donald Trump twice, which I thought was strange because he's talking about secrets and lies. And at the time of the writing, this statistic this comes from March 1st of this year, Donald Trump had already made 2,436 false or misleading claims in a little over a year in the White House. So my argument with White Michael Walzer is simply that he is ignoring the elephant in the room. He is missing the intelligence community blowing the whistle on Donald Trump for violating his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. That might sound like a partisan argument. I'm going to argue it's not a partisan argument. It's an American argument. And perhaps this can tie in very nicely to the themes of, of uh, the desire for unity that we heard coming out of the last panel. So what's my argument? My argument basically is Walzer's reasoning is thoughtful and nuanced and absolutely fine for politics as usual. But American politics today are highly unusual. Not meaning to argue that there aren't all sorts of continuities that Professor Scotchpole brought out so well in the first presentation this morning. But American politics today are highly unusual and we need to take that, account, that context into account because it changes the moral calculus that walls are presented. Because the current administration has launched an assault on the rule of law and the norms and practices of American democracy, officials in a position to blow the whistle on that effort are justified in doing so. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. First, I think it's really good to define our terms. And so I'd like to do that now because I'm going to define whistleblowing differently than Michael Walls, or just slightly differently. I'm keeping morality out of the equation, even though I want to make an argument about ethics. What's a, what's a better definition? I define whistleblowing as the insider exposure of illegal or improper activity. The the, the insider exposure of illegal or improper activity, and it's been recognized as a legitimate part of American politics from the founding onward. Indeed, in my book, I go right back to the founding and kind of provide an episodic history of whistleblowing in the United States. Whistleblowers, that is, that, that is they were given the first protection by the Second Continental Congress in 1778. You have a problem with the national security arena because it's never been consistently extended there for obvious reasons. It conflicts with another professional obligation, namely anybody in the national security, security community is supposed to guard classified information. They are breaking the law by disclosing classified information without authorization. So if we compare this definition I've just presented to you with partisan alternatives, I think it brings into fuller relief the vital role that truth-telling plays in sustaining civil discourse and American constitutional democracy, and I would argue that Hannah Arendt would agree with this. That is, whistleblowing is not a mere weapon for advancing partisan or personal interests in a fake news world. It is not what denigrates others or vindicates our own political biases. The extreme left and right may view any revelation of secret information as whistleblowing, but that's to blur important lines. So what do we mean? Let's just, it's useful to play around with the different, compare it to different terms like leakers and dissenters. So all whistleblowers are leakers, but not all leakers are whistleblowers. Leakers expose secrets, but secrets are not always a cover for misconduct, even if their revel revelations can often embarrass individuals and destroy careers. Whistleblowers, in contrast, expose lies and wrongdoing, which their perpetrators would like to keep secret. So I think you can see pretty clearly that whistleblowing is a cousin of civil disobedience, but they're not one and the same. There, there are some interesting overlaps, and today I've had some really interesting thoughts about how they're more connected than they might initially appear. I'll say a bit more about that later, perhaps. But here, let's just stick with some basic um, contrast. For Hannah Arendt, as Roger Berkowitz told you and put a nice slide up, I'm feeling really inadequate because I don't have a PowerPoint 
You know, I, I, I'm impressed by these PowerPoints that put up the quotations. It's not a bad thing. Anyway, so I, I don't think, I don't think uh, Roger quoted from this, but yes, he did. Should I repeat it? Even though there's no slide, are you going to be okay with that? Okay. So, so for Hannah Arendt, civil disobedience arises, quote, when a significant number of citizens have become, become convinced either that the normal channels of change no longer function or that, on the contrary, the government is about to change and has embarked upon and persists in modes of action whose legality and constitutionality are open to grave doubt, end quote. So what we might say, say there is that civil disobedience break laws that they want to see changed. I'm thinking of Rosa Parks is a good example, or challenged norms they want to see changed. In this sense, just like whistleblowers, all civil disobedience are dissenters, but all dissenters are not civil disobedience. How do whistleblowers differ from civil disobedience, that is? I think they differ because they appeal to the law or to the Constitution. That is, they appeal to the American rule of law tradition for justice. Whereas civil disobedience challenge directly the legitimacy of existing laws. Another way of thinking of it, perhaps, is that civil disobedience often aren't insiders, they're outsiders. And when I'm talking about whistleblowers, I'm talking about elites, really taking the high road and exposing misconduct they see that may be illegal and may be unconstitutional. Well, Arendt saw civil disobedience as uniquely American. It was a manifestation of what Tocqueville deemed America's greatest strength, the vitality of its associations or civil society that, that form that Tocqueville lauded. Civil disobedience wrote Arendt, are nothing but the latest form of voluntary association, quite in tune with the oldest traditions of the country." End quote. The same can be said of whistleblowers, who often, and I show this in my book, they often illuminate the gap between uh, American ideals and a fact-based world, the real world, where ideals aren't often and usually are not adhered to. Whistleblowing like civil disobedience, therefore, is distinctly American, and it's ultimately an indirect call to renew the rule of law through new legislation defining corruption and the abuse of power, because whistleblowers are often very focused on corruption and the abuse of power, and there's plenty of it going on, I need not tell you, in Washington today. Whistleblowing has a larger context. I'm focusing on public servants and the national security community, but obviously it, it's prevalent in the corporate world where protection of whistleblowing has become increasingly formalized in legislation, such as the 1986 Amendments to the False Claims Act, or Sarbanes-Oxley, or Do the Dodd-Frank reforms. But what's interesting here is that national security employees are explicitly excluded from the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 1989. And that, that exclusion was ratified when Congress updated the act in 2012. So whistleblowers in government have protection except in the national security realm. Extending national, uh, whistleblower protection to the national security realm is admittedly a complex challenge. You know, we don't want officials to have the right to decide for themselves whether classified information to be made public. My expertise is American foreign policy, and I can elaborate on the reasons why classified information is important, uh, if that's not obvious to you. And even today, leaks such as the release of transcripts of the president's conversation with foreign leaders, where he sounds completely ignorant and simply not up to the challenge of leading the free world, those don't constitute whistleblowing because the behavior revealed did not involve a gross violation of the rule of law. In such cir circumstances, I would argue that Walzer's invocation of the ethical calculus of civil disobedience is valid. Those leaks shouldn't happen. But when high officials in the executive branch who are sworn to uphold the Constitution openly flout and subvert it, and Congress fails to exercise its oversight responsibilities, then internal channels of dissent atrophy and a whistleblower's calculations change. 
that is, when the rule of law itself is threatened, whistleblowing can be necessary to defend liberal democracy as a whole. I would argue that illegal leaks that expose true betrayals of American democracy are neither partisan nor political, they are patriotic. Which brings me to the elephant in the room. Within days of taking office, President Trump fired Acting Attorney General Sally Yates, and a few months later, he fired FBI Director James Comey. Since then, he has repeatedly tried to impede the investigation of Special Counsel Robert Mueller, attacked and slandered anybody who criticizes him or refuses to accept his claims of absolute authority, and he's basically polluted public discourse with a stream of lies. Our whole system falls apart, Sally Yates would later say, when the citizens of our country lose confidence in the justice system and the Department of Justice. And Yates continued, almost from the very beginning of the Trump administration, we've seen breaches of these rules and norms from the White House. Now, she was a dedicated public servant confronting the danger firsthand, and she came out in a very different place than Michael Walzer. Her recommendation? When you see something happening that you think is wrong, and that's different from something that you don't think will be effective, I encourage you to speak up. That's the former acting attorney general. And, and I don't need to rehearse the evidence for you here. Uh, I can if you're interested in the questions, but Yates was not alone in believing these are exceptional times. I'm not making an unusual argument. As you may have noticed, an unprecedented number of former senior officials from the intelligence and national security communities of both political parties, every CIA director back to Ronald Reagan, have spoken out against what they consider a unique threat to American political culture and American institutions. And many of their counterparts inside the system agree and feel obliged to cry foul themselves, not from whim, not from partisanship, they believe they are honoring their own sworn oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. In his memoir, A Higher Loyalty, James Comey repeatedly compares Trump to a mafia boss. In Making Democracy Work, Robert D. Putnam delineates how mafia justice fills the vacuum that is created when the people have lost faith in their legal institutions as enforcers of impartial justice. I mean, that's what some people would argue was at stake in the Kavanaugh nomination, the whole idea of impartial justice. We could talk about that, if you like, in the questions. I think what's interesting here, and Comey writes about this, is that Donald Trump's idea of governance mirrors the way in which a criminal corruption network advances its interests. Or put another way, all of Trump's self-serving actions reflect faithlessness to the American legal order rather than partisanship. And for those who have dedicated their lives to public service, his abuse of power has been a call to arms. So I'll just give you one example, and there are many examples in the book. If you look at the F FBI director, only Donald Trump thinks that's a partisan appointment. FBI directors serve 10 terms, uh, excuse me, 10 year terms, and they're supposed to be above politics, impartial, loyal to the Constitution rather to than to a particular par political party. So when Barack Obama uh, was thinking of naming James Comey FBI director, he only met with him twice, once to interview him for the job, and once to tell him he was going to be nominated. At their second private meeting, the president told, this is President Obama, told James Comey it would be their last private meeting. Why? Well, because impartial justice requires an FBI director to be independent of the president. Now, contrast this with Donald Trump. You, can add, uh, uh, you don't have to add it up. I'll add it up for you. In the short four months before Trump actually fired James Comey without informing him first, on May 9th, 2017, Trump met with his inherited FBI director without others present no fewer than four times. And he spoke with him four times by phone. 
Trump also sought, sought out Comey to hug him publicly at a White House reception for the leaders of law enforcement agencies on January 22nd, 2017. That's, that's that funny story that Comey tells of trying to dodge the hug and it winds up looking like Trump is kissing him in public. So this is a real contrast to President Obama. Now, I'm sure that some of you might point to President Obama's use of executive orders as subversive of the rule of law. There's a legitimate argument there. And I'm not arguing that others are above criticism. We have all contributed to the mess we are in. Instead, I would simply like to focus on attention on where we are right now and what Americans should want to see happen from here. In his classic Just and Unjust Wars, Michael Walzer discusses the case of Arthur Harris, the leader of Great Britain's Bomber Command during the Second World War. He's, he's the man who was the architect of terror bombing raids on Germany that killed countless civilians. Walzer argued that in cases of supreme emergency, when the very existence of the state is at, quest, at question, it might be possible to fight unjustly for a just cause. He cited the carpet bombings of Dresden and the atomic bombs on Japan as examples. But he argues when the emergency has passed, moral order and ordinary bureaucratic behavior need to be restored. So he dishonors Arthur Harris. He doesn't let them, him be honored in Westminster Abbey, even though he asked him to do that. Why? Because the moral order, moral universe had been disrupted by war and needed to be restored for democracy to function properly after the war had been won. Well, think about that for a moment. If such reasoning could encompass and excuse the strategically worthless, random massacres of vast numbers of unarmed civilians, how can it not, at least hypothetically, encompass and excuse the occasional unauthorized disclosure of accurate but classified information? Accepting that point allows national discussion to turn to the real issue, the one before us now, in my view whether the Trump administration does indeed constitute a threat to the republic, and if so, what to do about it. Remember that Churchill dishonored Arthur Harris. He needed Harris to do dishonorable things during the war for a higher cause, but he also needed to condemn Harris thereafter to reaffirm the values that the British people had temporarily, temporarily overthrown to win the war. So that's why I would say once these unique depredations of the Trump presidency end, and, you know, it's not going to be utopia after that. All the things we've been talking about all day today, we're going to have to keep struggling and fighting and resisting. But I would argue that the leaking that is occurring in response to the Trump president presidency will obviously need to end as well. And I think there's every reason to expect it to, since there has never been any previous outbreak of such widespread national security whistleblowing that anyone can remember. And at that point, it will be possible to draw up the ethical balance sheets and assign everybody involved their proper penance. But until the immediate danger has passed, it makes sense, regardless of your political affiliation, to focus on the shocking substance of the information being revealed rather than the questionable, questionable means by which that information is coming to light. So in short, don't shoot the messenger listen to the message. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions. I'm just going to make one medium short uh, comment and then ask a question which uh, will provoke an answer of some length, maybe. I uh, admire the uh, way that Alison Stanger put together this argument for the propriety in the sort of crisis we're in now uh, of intelligence uh, operatives uh, playing the role of whistleblowers and uh, the feeling that they should not be uh, regarded as uh, insidious, dangerous to uh, uh, constitutional values in the way they otherwise would in view of the fact that we have a president uh, uh, who is anomalous. She argued that Donald Trump 
uh, has declared war on the rule of law and that therefore by the dictates of a higher loyalty, uh, as uh, James Comey uh, called it, um, it would be justified to take actions uh, against this president uh, by other institutions of government uh, that would not normally be countenanced. So a question that emerges from that, a first question, uh, I should think, is can a legitimate institution within uh, government blow the whistle on another legitimate institution? Um, the intelligence community, as we're now calling it. I'm somewhat ambivalent about that renaming of it also, uh, because it, it, it can't uh, escape the notice of people in this room that the matter of the uh, left liberal side in the United States and the Democratic Party becoming so uh, good-natured and trusting towards the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. I mean, this is a, this is a prodigious development, uh, and it, it, it ought to evoke a little suspicion. So I, I'm against the euphemism that's uh, coming in now of calling them the intelligence community, or communities, as we almost say about everything now. Let's call them spies and surveillance uh, apparatchiks. Um, is it okay for people like that, officers of the law too, um, the FBI operates under the Justice Department, which is an appointment made by the president, one of his cabinet. Um, is, it, is it legitimate for them? Uh, do they play a vital role uh, in truth-telling uh, by becoming, and here is, here is a little uh, further kink to the question, uh, wh whistleblowers or is it leakers? Uh, one distinction uh, that is sometimes made to uh, show why those two characters in public life play different roles is that the leaker is anonymous and does it in secret. The whistleblower wants to be identified as indeed protected by recent statutes uh, for exposing waste, fraud, and abuse. And abuse means corruption, corruption of the sort that is rife in the Trump administration. So Edward Snowden would be your model of a whistleblower, the deep throat uh, informant who um, gave secrets to Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, Mark Felt, as we now know of the FBI, would be an example of a leaker. Um, here's the question and an, an example to think about, and then I'll, I'll stop and, and leave it to Professor Stanger to uh, start our discussion by, by commenting on my comment. <clears throat> She concluded, I think tentatively and honestly, by saying this isn't something we want, uh, general countenancing and toleration of leaks from people in government against other people in government. Who do we, who do we trust? Uh, is that anything but partisan ever? Um, in this critical situation, in this most unusual situation, we, we might make an exception. The question is, is a, is a generalized policy of leaks a legitimate method of defensive war against a chief magistrate in order to uphold the rule of law in the long term, a chief magistrate who is described as having declared war on the rule of law. Um, in the draft of her paper that Professor Stanger gave me, she referred to this as a necessary uh, evil, and it is assumed that in some way of moral approval or disapproval we would condemn the intelligence community leakers afterward, or we would, in any case, uh, reinstitute a morale by which leaking would no longer be thought to be a, a possibly or even probably good thing. My question about this, as about so much concerning the media fight against Donald Trump, is once you've lost it, once you've lost certain habits of um, performing your function as it is understood uh, to be performed, whether it's uh, the function of a reporter at the Times or the Post, um, or of a, uh, an operative uh, in the FBI. Once you've lost that, how do you get it back? 
How do you get it back? That's a question people ask about the presidency, of course, and we have an easy time seeing that it's not going to be easy getting back the presidency as we've understood it. But this applies in other areas too. So the example to think through uh, about this would be the, the uh, publication from leaks, let's call them, because uh, the uh, source hasn't been identified, of the, the story about Rod Rosenstein, uh, who is the supervisor of the Mueller probe right now, about Rob Rosenst Rod Rosenstein having uh, uh, declared at one point in discussions in the early days after the firing of Comey, uh, his willingness to be wired to re record in secret things that Trump was saying in the White House just to prove to the country how chaotic, how impermissibly out of control this administration was. Rose, that was a September 21st story by, I believe, uh, Adam Goldman and Michael Schmidt. And there's another one today by Nicholas Fandos and Adam Goldman. Rosenstein to protect his status, and it is a status that works against Trump and for the perpetuation and protection of the a Mueller probe, Rosenstein denied that that was anything but a joke at most. The Times is on his tail and says today, no, no, it wasn't a joke. We have from our leaker very good evidence that he meant it in earnest. Here's what I would propose as my suspicion. It's only a suspicion. I can't know. But it's the sort of twisty surmise you get involved in once leaks are taken to be examples of higher loyalty. It's entirely possible that the Times is trusting their leaker as someone who is showing the chaos of the Trump administration from yet another point of view, but that the leaker is in fact somebody who is affiliated with the cell of the CIA, sometimes called the New York field office, that wants Trump to stay in power and that wants to embarrass Rosenstein, discredit him, and make it easier to fire him. But once they're on the story, the Times pursuing the leaks has to stay with the story. And we're now involved in a question whether this was good to do, whether things like this should go on being done, who they work against more, and I'll just conclude with saying it the same old way, how do we get it back? Yeah, that's great. Those are, those are great questions. I'm going to punt on the New York Times question, just because I haven't thought about it enough, but you're absolutely right. They, they have done some things that are, yeah, are worthy of, of closer scrutiny. And because uh, leaks are taken to be the way you work it now. Yeah, and that's deeply problematic. L let me take up the, the restor restoration question first, because I think it's kind of the, what I would call the toothpaste question. You know, when you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube and you say, oh, no, I shouldn't have taken all that toothpaste, and then you want to put it back in. It's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube, right? So the question is, once these violations have taken place for extraordinary circumstances, how do you get it back? Well, Great Britain got it back after World War II, so that's one example. But um, I think another argument for why we could expect the intelligence communities to go back to their previous behavior is just that they, they hate leaking. They hate leaking. I'll just give you an example, um, and you can read my book for more details. For this book, I, had, I interviewed all the senior leadership of the NSA at the time of the Snowden leaks, as well as all the NSA whistleblowers. And I spent a whole day at the National Security Agency for a off-the-record Chatham House rule briefing with four other academics from Carnegie Mellon, maybe five. That was a totally interesting experience because I went into it thinking one thing, that I was stepping into a, a spy novel, and I was going to see all the way this dark institution, deep state, operated. And what you ran into instead was these enormously hyper geeky, patriotic people that, in a million years, I mean, they they hate they hate leaking. And the reason they do, they were they were arguing about just whether they could say certain things in front of this. You have all these classification levels, and they're like, you know, okay, can I go U UFO on this and you, you don't even know what half the acronyms mean. That's a whole other story. But they don't like leaking. Why? Well, if you're in intelligence, you, any piece of information you might possibly disclose, even the most banal, is potentially the missing jigsaw puzzle piece in somebody's you know, intelligence operation. 
So they're totally bizarre about leaking any information precisely for that reason. They don't want to provide that missing puzzle piece. So what they're doing in that context is just breathtaking. And you see the Trump administration trying to paint it as though, oh, they're partisan. They are so nonpartisan. They repeat every five minutes. And this, I'm talking about the NSA. I haven't spent time at the FBI, and that might be different. Um, all of that makes me hopeful that once the danger has passed, you can re return to ordinary democratic behavior. Um, the whole thing about Snowden, I mean, that's a whole interesting tale as well, because he's obviously the one who, who raises this issue in the first place. This, is, this book took forever to write, because I essentially finished the whole thing and then Snowden happened. And I started writing on him and it's so enormously complicated that it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then I realized it was a second book and before I knew it, the manuscript was going through seven different iterations so it really was a, a challenging experience but I, I learned a lot through that. And what I learned about Snowden that is quite extraordinary is that I think there's a high probability I call him in the book uh, America's first traitor patriot because even though at the time everybody was saying he was working for the Russians, he was working for the Chinese, I mean, you can go through any of those theories you want to talk to because I've thought about them endlessly. You know, the man in charge of the leaks operation, Chris Inglis, who was number two at the NSA at the time, is on the record saying that he thinks he acted alone without help for it. He was winging it. He was doing it on the fly. And that's a, a, a really interesting thing. But what did he expose? What did he reveal? Without going into enormous detail? He basically revealed, it's kind of the converse of my argument, it's something to think about. He revealed that emergency measures were taken after 9-11 that totally turned NSA operating, standard operating procedures on their head. What happened was you used to have, used to, have to have a warrant to get information on somebody. But in the internet world, after 9-11, President Bush's secret executive order basically made it possible to do dragnet surveillance. In other words, you just suck it all up through whatever means possible, and then you're supposed to have to query that information with a warrant. But you're collecting all this information without, you know, the sort of procedures you would have used previously. That was justified for emergency uh, situation. What Snowden revealed in a nutshell is that emergency operating procedures had become business as usual without Americans knowing it, that you know, over a decade later, those same practices were considered acceptable. And so you could argue that that was information that the American people should have. And a debate ensued, and there was legislation that changed some of the practices. Uh, with respect to your question, I guess, I'll, about President Trump and blowing the whistle, you know, one institution blowing the whistle on another institution, which is a great point that you're making, the way I would respond to that is that I don't think the intelligence community is blowing the whistle on the institution of the American presidency. They are blowing the whistle on an individual who's behaving unlike any other past president. Um, he, he is not serving the people of the United States. He is serving himself. I am a former uh, uh, Russian studies person. My dissertation was in Soviet foreign policy. I followed the Russians for a long time. I cannot tell you, and members of the intelligence community would react this way as well, when the American people are learning news about what the president is doing through Russian media sources, this Ambassador Kisilak thing, you're just in totally uncharted territory. So uh, the, the uh, intelligence operatives who leak or blow the whistle uh, on, and sometimes it's unclear which, uh, J John Brennan may have information we don't have. He's now been denied his security clearance, so he doesn't have it anymore. But, you know, we know him by name, so whistleblower, but also we don't know where it comes from or whether he's actually using it to say what he wants to say in the form of a political opinion. Um, I agree with you as a, you know, a reader of motives in this case that they're not attacking the presidency, they're attacking this anomalous exception to it. But was James Clapper, who is one of the ex-intelligence operative heroes of the campaign against Trump, was he acting against the Constitution when he was asked by uh, Senator Ron Wyden uh, 
do you collect any type of data on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? And Clapper answered, not wittingly, false, a lie. And he later said it was some, something he regretted. But that was one of the moments in American public life that drove Snowden to do what he did. He has said so on more than one occasion. Uh, this is the sort of ambiguity that interests me. Maybe we should turn it over to the audience, uh, unless you want to answer that specifically. But it seems to me that there's this other entity we're, we're talking about, separate from the institutions of government or the branches, and that is the Constitution. And the relationship of the intelligence agencies to the Constitution is very ambiguous. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. I think we should turn it over to the audience. So I'm as, happy to as answer moderator, the question. But um, yeah. Yes. Uh, you who, yes, you, yes, right there. <laughs> Are we on? There. Thank you. Um, I have heard earlier today uh, the concern of cynicism becoming the outcome of uh, the aftermath of the current administration and all of this. And, as you were speaking and talking about spy novels and all of that, um, I can't help but think that people seem to be processing leaks or whistleblowing and these levels through their um, partisan versions of cynicism to the point that um, I feel like I'm sucked into a spy novel and can you actually believe that the people, especially in the leaks because they're not giving their name, that they are actually not themselves um, unaware of their own motives, um, especially in the face of having maybe um, a commander in chief that they find personally so distasteful. Um, can we be sure that just because they're very nerdy that they are actually um, completely impervious to these influences? So how do we, how do we process um, the leaks and the whistleblowing through, um, through that lens? That's a great question. There's so many TV shows where they show these NSA guys and they're like using the, the tools to spy on their girlfriend and all these things that make the American people really suspicious. And you know, individuals are individuals. We have to judge them on an individual basis. I'm just giving you an impression from visiting there. It wasn't what I expected. Jeff Stone, who chaired President Obama's NSA review panel, also had the exact same experience of like, wow. But we don't come away from that saying, trust the NSA. They need oversight. But they are trying to serve the country. Uh, I think, I think that, that, that is indisputable. Having said that, you know, we're living in this climate where there, there is such, it's such an ideological time, and people, you, you often have these two different narratives that have nothing in common. I'm sure you've noticed this in your own lives when you're arguing, arguing about a particular issue. You know, the two sides, two parties have different narratives, nothing in common. Same is true with this stuff on leaks. And so one of the challenges for my book was you had this narrative from the NSA whistleblowers, you had this narrative from the NSA, they had nothing in common. And so what do you do? Well, I think you just painstakingly have to figure out what the truth is. And that is really, really hard work but rewarding and part of the reason I th the way I think we're going to combat this age of cynicism is through education such as these conferences today but I'm hoping that my book I spent a lot of time I, you know I think I must have cut 600 pages of carefully polished and sourced prose to try to write something that the American people would actually read to help them better understand the issues when they vote so to me education is key it's a great question Gentleman back there. Hi, thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I have some questions about what I think is your central premise in uh, that Trump is sui generis, that Trump is such a liar or has done something so different as president. Do you dispute that? Well, yes. Yes and no. He is such a liar. <laughs> and it may well be that the sheer number of lies, it probably is, is unprecedented. I, th I think that's true. But, but not all lies are equal. And I think we're talking about lies that are a threat to the foundation of... Like, he 
lies about everything as a reflex. It, like it's, it, in other words, he's uniquely narcissistic and uh, insensitive and vulgar for someone holding any high office in this country. It, it is shocking. I'll say he evokes incredible reactions, positive and negative because his personality is shocking. I'm a New Yorker, and we knew about him a long time ago, and it's, 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 it's beyond belief that this person is president. But, but we have to, I think, stick to principles when we want to make an exception for a president. And so I would refer back to George Bush Jr., Bush the Lesser, who presided over a war in Iraq that was built on calculated lies, knowing, I, I was very involved in the whole Iraq thing, and you had an intelligence operation within the US intelligence community that, that rammed lies down the throat of the CIA against the judgment of the average professional that, that ended Colin Powell's career by forcing, and these were, these were deliberate deceptions using false informants from Iraq, building up a whole case that was known to be lies by, it's a conspiracy by high people in government. So that was a big lie. That was a very important lie with huge foreign policy consequences. And that's not the only time that's happened in American history. It's, it's one that I'm very aware of because I got into the weeds of it. But has Trump, I mean, so if we're gonna make this argument for Trump, we don't make that argument for Bush. We don't make that argument for other people in the past. And it reminds me of this danger. I, I'm, I'm an international lawyer, a human rights lawyer. There were a number of people who, after the, new, the World Trade Center attacks, took a position that this threat we face is sui generis. We are gonna change international law. We're gonna violate human rights because it's sui generis. And these are people like Richard Falk. These are, these are esteemed progressives who are suddenly taking this position. And it turned out to be not right. And I'm wondering, do, we, do you feel there's enough to say we need to reverse uh, or we need to have a particular policy for this guy? I don't doubt that there are people in the intelligence community who are horrified by this guy. To me, I don't know if that's enough unless that's applied consistently. And you could add that the case for the Iraq war based on falsehood was also operated through leaks to Michael Gordon and Absolutely. Judith Miller of the New York Times. It was. It, and I'm sorry, one last thing. You also referenced history in Bomber Harris and raised the, 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 the issue that, well, in a state of emergency, when national survival is threatened, you can just do away with, with this now. You know, now there's a, I'm forgetting the German doctrine from Clausewitz Kriegsraisen or Kriegspiel, basically says when survival is threatened, all bets are off. And he asks the question, what rational, decent leader of a country would prefer the destruction of your country to violating international law? Well, the issue there again is, if we've got the bomb, great. We're going to agree. If Hitler had the bomb, is that what we want? Who decides? Who decides the emergency? And I'm also thinking, I've lived in Asia for a long time, where built into constitutions is the exception, the emergency. Who decides the military? Okay, so I think, yeah, yeah, thank okay, you. I've very very point. cogent yes. and a comment as well as a question, but the question is about the danger of the exception. I don't find the, the exception dangerous at all because I think you're conflating apples and oranges in your example. You know. With Donald Trump, we know the lies because he tweets them out. They're not the product of some normal bureaucratic process. The Iraq war and the lies there, we could have a longer discussion about that, but they are in part the product of a bureaucratic process gone awry because intelligence officials were wanting to give the administration the reports they wanted to hear. And if you go through American foreign policy history, American foreign policy almost always goes off the rails when intelligence is politicized. The Vietnam War is a case in point. How do you deal with these lies? Whistleblowers. Daniel Ellsberg. I mean, we can name other ones. There were whistleblowers in the, in the uh, Iraq War case as well. So I don't see a danger. 
I, I think that we can take this up when further questions come, but th this question also had in it a characterization of Trump's lies, which I think there's something to, namely that the, the lies are so pro endlessly proliferating about such small things as the size of the crowd at his inauguration. And that's typical. That's typical of, of the lies that go out in a daily tweet. The tweets are covered by the same papers that uh, operate from leaks. Um, th that th 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 Trump is, so to speak, <laughs> qualitatively different in the quantity of his little lies. But the, the, the big consequential lie put together by Cheney and Bush uh, resulted in a mass of deaths and the destruction of American policy in one whole portion of the world, which we haven't yet seen from Trump. Um, that's, I suppose, a, a comment which steps out of my role as a moderator, so we should take another question. <laughs> yes, up there. Yes, um, so my question has to do with the anonymous New York Times op-ed from uh, a little over a month ago. Yeah where this anonymous individual claims that they're part of a resistance within the Trump administration. And I, I'm not sure if it's a political appointee, I'm not sure if it's a career person, but regardless, this individual feels, and it, you know, it's probably a very right-wing conservative person who feels that they need to protect the country against Trump's worst impulses. So we'll get you know, a tax bill through, we'll get all these other things through, but we still need to protect the country. And it was really interesting because it was basically leaking about something that they themselves are involved in and acknowledging that. Yeah. But it's also inherently anti-democratic. Um, you know, the, in addition to this, people moving memos and papers off Trump's desk in the Oval Office because it would have been some brazen action. And, and that actually is subverting democracy. Now that might have a positive result where he doesn't do these terrible things, but it's a very unique situation, which I'm not sure we've ever actually experienced. Um, and that goes in line with such a, the, the unique presidency of Donald Trump right now. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts within the administration of this happening, not just with this person, but likely with many others? It's a great question um, and an excellent point. Foreign Affairs asked me to, that's the one thing I had to update when that anonymous piece came, came out. I would say that I agree with you, and I would add that uh, it's not an instance of whistleblowing. Why? Because we didn't learn anything we didn't already know. You know, we knew that people were rational. I didn't learn anything from that. So no new misconduct was revealed. What would have been useful is an anonymous uh, op-ed that actually gave us concrete information that would advance the Mueller investigation. Then I'd be more impressed. But um, no, I mean, we could have a lot of speculation about who really wrote that and why but it's not whistleblowing. But there's, there's a further point that that question um, is involved with, mm -hmm. namely uh, the, the anonymous author within government was testifying to what <laughs> ancient and modern political theorists call an imper imperium in imperio, a, a power within the power, a secret government within the government. The fact is, that we have a check on, uh, on someone like Donald Trump because he's a public figure and because of the leakers, but not only because of that, because of lots of things that are still working in American democracy and, and the way uh, official acts are publicized. But we have no check against the government within the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very undemocratic. Um, i just like to better understand what you're saying about the relationship of Trump and Trump's lies against what the intelligence community is doing. Because it doesn't seem, as I observe it, and you may have things that will help me understand it, you may see it differently, it doesn't seem to me that the intelligence community is in any way going out on the limb significantly in exposing Trump's lies. If Clapper or Brennan or any of these people have something to say, it's very much on the surface. Uh, they're not exposing secrets. Uh, they're talking generally. They're confirming things that are said openly by the di current director of national intelligence. So uh, it, I, I just like to, to understand better. I mean, uh, Chelsea Manning, Snowden, these are rogues. They're really not part of the intelligence community. So would you they see both were. Hmm? 
They both were. Well, they were contract. Well, one was an enlisted person and one was a contractor. Uh, so, so certainly they were subject to, to rules, to be sure. But in terms of the uh, leadership of the intelligence community, I don't see anyone going out on a limb with regard to leaking classified information or sensitive information. Do, do you? Yeah, well, the, uh, part of the reason we know so much about what's going on inside the Trump White House is due to extraordinary leaking both from the intelligence community and other people. So we need to make a distinction when you talk about the intelligence community. There are people who are serving right now who are one category, and there are people who, who have once served who are speaking out. So, so um, that distinction needs to be kept in mind. Are you, I, guess, I guess what I'm, uh, what are you getting at with that? Because I, I don't, yeah, uh, I mean, what, you're disputing that there are some leaks? Or? Well, there, there are leaks, but then uh, sensitive compartmentalized information, data, has there, any, has there been any dump of data out of the intelligence community during the Trump administration that, um, uh, that, that warrants being called a leak of, of, uh, of classified data. Well, I mean, well the, the James Comey's memoranda about his meetings with Trump yeah. could be called leaks. They may be prosecuted. Exactly. Um, he, has a, he has a special understanding of, of them, uh, according to which uh, he was head of the FBI, and then he was not. Um, and he t when he took them home as no longer head, they became his own property. Also, that, that things he wrote on his uh, machine at home uh, that came from personal con you, you see how it works. But that, that is information from within the intelligence community, if the FBI is part of it, that then made its way out in Senate testimony first. So would that qualify as the sort of thing yeah, you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, and there's uh, countless other examples, which, which uh, I could, would you like me to enumerate some? I mean, they, they often, the, 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 pa the pattern you see is the leak comes out and it's covered what's going on inside the White House, and then the person who's in charge is fired. McMaster is one great example, the National Security Advisor. Somebody, some, some, somebody was leaked for uh, talking about the meeting that Trump had with the Russian ambassador in his office where certain things were discussed that reported in the newspapers via Russian media sources. That's unprecedented to have Russians in the Oval Office and news to emanate from Russian news sources. That just doesn't happen. But so someone I, leaked that and then McMaster is fired. Allison, can I follow up? Yeah. I want a couple of these questions. I mean, you said, you mentioned Snowden, who released something that was unknown mm -hmm. and arguably illegal. Um, and then you mentioned, you know, well, it's different if you just have a conversation with world leaders, but they're sort of bad form. Right. What has been released about Trump in all these leaks or whistleblowings that is beyond bad form? And I admit that it's really bad form, and it's not the norm. But I'm wondering, you know, what, what reaches the sort of standard of someone like Snowden that has been released? It's a good question, now I see what you're getting at. And this is where you get, I'm sort of t intentionally avoiding these questions because it involves premature judgment about the Mueller investigation. But a lot of the leaks, if you go through them, and I do in my book, have to do with extraordinary connections between the Russians and the Trump campaign. And his unbelievable capacity to excuse just about anything that Putin does and defend Putin against you know, his own administration. And that, that, that is unprecedented. So that's... A, a so, so I guess what I'm saying is, is I'm hesitating to comment on it because I don't have full information yet, but as, a, as a, someone who, who has studied Russian activities and know that they are the best in the business, I can just tell you that uh, I think there are going to be some pretty big bombshells coming out eventually. So I think she's... What's that? I, yeah. I, <laughs> and I would also tell you that I just had some documents dumped on me just last week. That's coat trailing. That's really unfair. And at that point, I think I have to close down the proceedings. But what? we should we should all do, <laughs> we should all do. 
there's something you could say if you wanted to, but you won't. No, I don't want to. It's depressing. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't want to depress us, and there are refreshments uh, waiting outside, so please Time join me in, in, in giving a warm. <laughs>